So welcome everyone. Um, what a pleasure and an honor to have all of you gathered here today to share with us um, your journey on a really magnificent film. I've seen it a couple of times and Aggie is just a really, you can't see my hands on my heart. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. So I'd like to start um, by introducing the director and one of the producers, Catherine Gunn. Catherine, thank you for joining us. Would you tell us a little bit about you and then we'll move it around? Um, thank you so much. We are really thrilled to be here in the Ashland Online Film Festival. This is the first one that we're doing. We appreciate the efforts to keep the films going, keep the festival alive, and to give people the outlet for which the film was intended, which is to be able to spread the news, share awareness, educate, inspire, bring beauty and joy, and tell a story that hopefully makes other people want to live their best selves and sort of feel invigorated to participate in any way they can. Um, so I produced the film with Tanya Silveratnam, who um, will speak in a moment, and we we started out with a. Um, you know, a premiere at Sundance and we had a great LA screening. We screened in Doc Fortnite and then everything came to a sudden standstill. And I think the messages in this film remain the same. So we're really excited to be able to share this with the Ashland audiences. Tanya? Hi, I'm Tanya Salvaratnam. I've been working with Catherine on many, many projects over the last 13 years and I'm a proud producer of Aggie. I'm also a part-time resident of Oregon. Um, so as Catherine said, you know, our screenings came to a halt with the advent of the pandemic, but the message of the film, if anything, feels more relevant than ever because mass incarceration in particular has become even more prominent in the news and hopefully this film will help pivot consciousness towards positive solutions. And on that note, I want to take it to Gil, who put it together. Hi, my name is Gil Seltzer. I am the editor of Aggie. And I came to the film uh, by a previous collaboration with Kat. Um, and it's, it was an honor working on the film. It's, you know, I learned a lot. Um, and I got to meet all of these amazing people. Um, I got to be involved in the art and um, to a small degree in the justice component of the film and of Aggie's work, and I'm just fortunate to be here. Hi, I'm Xiveria Simmons, and I am an artist, a uh, visual artist and performing artist, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Oregon holds a, a very particular, uh, special place in my heart for its history. We, When you really understand the history, which is kind of what Aggie's film, um, Catherine's film about Aggie is all about is partially understanding how narrative and history and documentary um, can help us go towards a better, brighter future. Um, and you think about all the shifts we have to make. Um, Oregon has the ability to change so many things in its history over the next few years in, in terms of history and mass incarceration. So I'm really excited for the community to see this film and to remember the history and to move it forward um, in a more positive, uh, just uh, motion. Adnan. Hello everyone, my name is Adnan Khan. I am the executive director of Restore Justice. Um, a little bit about me, at the age of 18, I was sentenced to 25 years to life in an adult facility. Um, about 14 years into my incarceration, I had the privilege and honor in a prison facility in San Quentin to meet Aggie, Kat, uh, other people like Darren Walker and Helena Huang also came in with, uh, with the group. And it was such a privilege. I was there serving a life sentence and someone like Aggie, Kat, Darren came into, and Helena came into not just meet us or do a tour of the prison, which in my opinion is very like similar to going to a zoo and looking at the animals who are caged. What I appreciated and never left my heart was how the, the communication, the interaction, um, the, we were literally shoulder to shoulder next to each other. There was no fear there. Um, and who knew two years later that my life sentence would be vacated and I would be out. And next thing you know, I'm in New York in Kat's house and eating ice cream. 
uh, at her house. <laughs> I love that story. I mean, I, it, it is amazing. It, you know, it's so moving and important right now to realize that, like Tanya started to say, what we started um, with Art for Justice of trying to get, you know, change the narrative, bring attention, but also to really foreground the leadership of formerly incarcerated people like you, who have, you know, what Anand didn't say is that part of why he got out was a law, a bill that he helped craft and passed, and he was the first one out because of it. And that's the kind of leadership that I think we need today, right now, and that we're getting. We have gotten out, I believe I heard this morning that 2% of the prison population has been released in the last four weeks. It is a drop in the bucket. It's of course a, a step in the right direction, but when you think of sort of nursing homes and, and prisons and jails, these are places where people are very close in close contact and that is why they, they are the epicenters. I think right now Cook County Prison is the epicenter of the epidemic in the whole world. Um, and everybody needs to focus on that. Yeah. I actually, usually I would start with a question for the director, but um, because of the, because of where we are today and because we have Adnan with us, um, I, I'd like to ask, I'd like to start with a question for you, which is um, you are an advocacy fellow for the Art for Justice Fund. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about where we are today, what you see as your biggest challenger, what is your biggest opportunity, what are you working on, what do you want people who are watching this to know about the work? There's, yeah, thank you, Laura. I think there's been an urgent shift in a lot of our work, everyone, whether you're advocacy or everyone that's on this uh, Zoom call and who's watching right now. Um, in my personal personal work, the, the work that we do has a lot to do with from what we call proximity to policy, meaning we bring in people. That's, that's some of the magic that helped pass the law that ended up getting me out. We're bringing in stakeholders, legislators, survivors, victims of crime, uh, district attorneys into the prison. And very similarly, like Aggie and Kat um, and Helena Darren did, come to the prison and meet people who are currently incarcerated. And since we obviously can't do that anymore uh, and COVID hit, our work has shifted with, in a, with a sense of urgency to one, um, reduce the prison population and do it safely. And what I mean by that is not just um, tear down these walls and just let people come out. The truth is that people are not only coming out or we're asking them to be to come out in the middle of a pandemic, but people are also coming out in the middle of an economic crisis. So as we reduce the prison population, I think it's extremely important uh, in the same breath, in the same vein, to try to uh, come up with creative ways to provide safe housing for people that are returning back into our communities and on top of that proper financial aid um, And then there's other uh, work that's being done in terms of like trying to provide hand sanitizers and masks through donations and and distribute them within the prisons um, But if I could quickly just just build context for the audience and, and just speaking for California alone so California has a hundred and twenty thousand people incarcerated in our state prison 67,000 staff work in these facilities, which means that 67,000 people come in and out of these state facilities every eight hours, because we all know prisons never shut down, they're open 24 seven, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, uh, your birthday, my birthday, doesn't matter, they're always open. So the point is that people can say whatever happens in our prison system, it just stays there as if the COVID-19 um, safely contains itself within prison walls, and that's absolutely not true. We're actually being affected as people in society, and what we're seeing is the interconnectedness that human beings have in order to beat and defeat COVID-19. Um, we kind of have to work together. And so in that, um, our work has shifted to, yes, reducing the prison population and making that push, but doing it safely with housing and employment or financial aid, uh, but more so educating uh, society that this this isn't just a prison issue. This is an issue for all of us because we are all we all can get the virus if we don't focus on our prisons and jail population. Thank you for that. That um, I I wanted now to shift uh, to Catherine. Um, I have so many questions for all of you, so we'll just we'll work th through what we can. Um, making a film about someone who's an icon 
uh, a, a powerful, very influential person who also happens to be one's mother. <laughs> I'm wondering if you would talk about the genesis of the project and maybe how, like what were some of the surprises or how did the film change? As I understand you shot it over a couple, a, a period of a couple years. Oh, you need to take off your microphone. Sorry about that. It was something that I had um, always said I would not do because people who knew Aggie at different points and knew I was a documentary filmmaker had suggested it might be an interesting project. And I was like, that is the last thing I'll ever do. Um, and then what happened, well, there were two things that came together. One is I started to realize that as a mother, um, that I didn't have footage of her, she doesn't like being on camera, and that she had, um, that, that, that there was, you know, I think everyone should go and interview everyone. I think we should all be interviewing each other all the time. We know so little about each other. And I wanted to just document, not for a film, but I wanted to make some recordings um, and ask her some questions. And I asked her if I could do that, and she said yes. And I said maybe five or six different ones and I talked to her about different things and I set it up and I did one interview and it was awful and I was awful and she was awful and it was I think Gil what did we use like five seconds from that original interview um and then I, I have four children I, I asked them you know they all have these adorable relationships with her and I thought they could do interviews and I didn't tell them what to do I just asked them to come up with their own questions and they each did an hour long interview, which you see some of those in bits and pieces. You see all the kids in the film. Um, and then I realized I shouldn't do any more interviews because she really comes alive with the people around her. I mean, that's part of why this COVID isolation is so hard for extroverts and really social people um, like her. It's really hard not to, you know, people whose love language is affection and touching and being together. I mean, she encounters probably 400 people on an average day when mm -hmm. we're not in isolation. So um, I realized there was sort of a way of telling this story through the prism of her own people, her friends, her colleagues, the artists that she loves. She's always taught me that um, collecting art was not about the objects, not about the pieces, the art pieces, but was really about her relationship with the artists themselves. So you see Zyveria in the film, she goes to the studio and Zyveria speaks so beautifully about what it's like to have someone come into this most intimate space. And yet there's Aggie who for her, that's the most important thing she can do, whether she has a piece or not, or she gives so much art away, mostly to museums, but also to her children and to friends. But you know, it's just about creating a world where the artist can survive, because if we don't support artists' work, the artist can't survive. So I started asking different people if they do these interviews and I still wasn't making a movie. Um, and Tanya, who I've worked with before several times, said, you know, each one of these little interviews could be cut into a short or a, its own film. And she, and she was very patient. And I remember, you know, once a week she would say, are, are you making a movie yet? Are, you make, are, are, are we making this movie? Um, and I'd say, no, I'm gonna do one more interview. And then when once we started, we just jumped right in and we actually brought Gil in very early on. Um, he worked with us editing. We edited for a year, a full year, which is a real luxury and was, um, was how we decided, you know, there's not a natural story. It's how we decided what part of the story to tell. And I think the, ultimately, the reason I decided to make a movie was because she started the Art for Justice Fund and it was something that I thought was extraordinary. So I don't think if the Art for Justice Fund didn't exist, um, I, I wouldn't, and it was starting right around the time I was doing these little interviews. And then I thought that's worth doing because I want other people to join in that, to look at themselves as people who can participate, who can change the world for the better, who can be open to whatever the difference is, the difference in people, you know, what Adnan says about proximity and how important it is, you know, that's the, the basis of the problems with segregation in this country are that we don't know people who are different than us. We don't live with them. We don't understand that the world is a lot bigger than we are. And I think there is a way that Aggie, and the reason I, and the film with Ava's comments is that Aggie really 
is the an, an artist in the sense that she's imagining something that's not there. She imagines a world that's different than this one. And I think artists show us the way to do that and activists do too. And that's what Ava says is all, you know, Adnan, Zagiria, all of us are actually looking at a blank canvas, whether it's the world or the canvas or through the camera lens and saying, what would be better? How, what can take us there? I mean, this piece behind Adnan's head is so incredible that the story may be too long for now but you know just even to see that somebody said that was worth doing that's a place worth going that's a thing that's going to allow all of us access to whatever it might be hopefully it will include joy but it could be all kinds of resonant deep meaning and significance and learning emotional learning having access to our own emotions having access to other people's emotions Art brings us so much. I don't know how you ever say what art means, but that was a long answer. That's why I made the movie. And uh, actually, I think, Tanya, I'd like to ask you because um, one of the things that struck me about each of your biographies is your social engagement and your activism. And I'm curious, as, a produ as the, one of the producers on the film, what you are when you came on the project I, I understand this is the fourth project that you and Catherine have worked on together I think that's right like and three I'm, and a half three, okay um but I'm just curious if you could talk about as a at your, when you put on your producer hat and you put on your activist hat what was really exciting for you about this project um what was a big takeaway for you well, the takeaway is that uh, Aggie really emulates the ability of one, one person to make a massive difference. I mean, yes, she has resources that made it possible for her, but it's also her conviction and her passion that really shines and her deep, deep empathy. Like for me, the, the, one of the takeaways for the film is encapsulated in what Darren Walker says, which uh, basically is that with, um, you know, without art, there is no empathy and without empathy, there is no justice. And Aggie really manifests that. And so that's what uh, uh, attracted me to the film, aside from my like long history with Catherine, which happens to have coincided with activism as well. You know, I first became aware of Catherine and her work when I was on the board of the, Miss Found uh, of the Third Wave Fund, which Catherine co-founded many, many years ago. So it was activism that really brought us together in the first place. Um, and it's kind of like a, a, a beautiful um, nexus of art and justice that is in, embodied in this film and that also brought me and Catherine together in the first place. And I also feel very strongly that the film shows that anyone can make a difference, that no one is too small to make a difference, and that hopefully it inspires other people. And we've already seen that happening at the screenings that have taken place where people feel like they want to do something after seeing it. And that's what I really hope that people take away from this film, that there is something that they all can do. So just as a, a follow up to that, um, and maybe at the end, you can all share websites and things like that, but you have a, the film has a really extensive, I was like kind of blown away with the film's website. It is very extensive. It has the artwork, it has resources, it has Aggie's social justice reading list, which is like <laughs> a powerhouse of, of books. Um, and I just, is there something special that you'd like to, and then also the Art for Justice Fund is its own magnificent website. Is there something that you'd like to share now or later about the website uh, to share with audiences that might be watching this? Kat, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, I thank you for saying that. It was, you know, a labor of love, but each little project we do that's related to the film, you know, I thought you were going to say, there's this extensive outreach and impact campaign, which there was, um, but it doesn't exist now, which involved concerts and visits into prisons to get people inside. Um, you know, I love the line when Aggie says in the film, Darren says, you know, some people think the prison system is fine the way it is. And Aggie just looks at him completely nonplussed and says, have they ever been in a prison? Because she went inside, met Adnan and, and, and a lot of other men that were in with him 
And she was just like, how could anybody think this is, system is okay? Um, and so I think that the idea, every step we take to extend the messages and the themes of the film, the, the website was the next one after the film. Um, it in, does include a lot of the artwork. We want people to realize the feast of artwork that they've seen with the film. There's 250 pieces of art that you lay your eyes on during the film. Um, and it's all got this kind of, you get this sense that there's an internal coherence that isn't explicit. It's not all from the 1970s or all made by women or all one medium of, you know, painting. It's, a, you know, there's film and there's poetry and there's paintings and performance. And we wanted the website to allow people to actually understand and experience some of that artwork more. So we put in all the information about the artists and the medium and the genre and the years and stuff like that. We are also right now um, working on making a game, which I won't go too far into, but the game is a very fun game, which you don't have to know anything about art, but it does just keep encouraging people to look and to learn and to access these parts of them and that may not be on this physical plane. Um, and so the website, I think, you know, we didn't want to recreate the Art for Justice website, but we wanted to really be sure that people access that because there, Art for Justice is a special place that has created over these last three and a half years, a community of artists and activists who are actually, and maybe Zyberia, you could speak to this in, in a second, is, is how the artists and the activists are really working together. Um, we've, you know, there are incredible activists who are in the, criminal justice reform movement. There are wonderful artists who've been making socially engaged work, um, but this is a space we believe maybe, you know, and it's happening more and more, but where people are really activated together to figure out how to, you know, for our, the advocates to be thinking, how can we get our message across? They may be just completely right about everything, but how can people access what they're trying to say? And for the artists, you know, what can make my work more meaningful? If, you know, if I've really got the information I need, if I've really got the access to the emotional component that is driving me to do my work, and how can they do it? Zyberia, do you want to speak about one or two of your activating art and advocacy grants? Oh, sure. Um, you know, it's been really amazing to be in this community and to learn so much. I think what um, Art for Justice in particular has given me is the time to really understand the dynamics of this country. And I think when you understand the dynamics of how this country was built, and especially through a creative lens, you understand that, I mean, ultimately prison abolition has to be the thing because you know, when I was speaking about Oregon, for instance, thinking about the fact that in the, the 19, 1900s, you know, Oregon banned Black people, you know, we obviously understand that the United States is built on, you know, stolen lands, you know, from various tribes throughout the country. And, and you know, for a long period of time, and, and, and it's ongoing, like, so when you start to understand that visually, not only intellectually, there's, there's something to understand something intellectually, to read about it, to understand the laws, um, but it's another thing to then digest that, that, that information visually and to, to really take it as your own and then to be able to put it out in different art forms. And, and so that's like one part of my practice in terms of art for justice and thinking about Aggie. That's something that Aggie has, um, you know, really supported in my own projects and processes. But also um, recently I'm working with a group called Fair and Justice Prosecution, and that's a group of progressive prosecutors. And, you know, while one could say like, what's a progressive prosecutor? Ultimately, like, we don't want prosecutors, right? We want another system. But you have, there's layers to get to undoing. There's layers to unwinding. And so I'm working with, there's about 30 progressive prosecutor, prosecutorial offices in the country that are really pushing towards um, decarceration and understand and teaching people in, the, in their communities how to do that. At and what steps it takes, and also teaching the prosecutors, the electeds, how 
uh, other ways, like taking them on trips to Germany so that they can see that like the, the systems that we have in the United States are, are some of the most barbaric. So how do, you, how do you show people another way? And so my process is now, I don't really need to reinvent the wheel because Fair and Justice really knows what they're talking about. But what I'm interested in doing is opening up their narrative. I'm an artist, so I'm going to tease out their narrative. I'm also interested in putting beauty into their narrative, which is something you don't normally think about when you think about district attorneys or prosecutors or elected official officials is, well, where does the beauty come in? And that's something that we're working through is how can we tell your narrative? How can we show that the, the prison industrial system that we have, which is foundational to the United States, how can we tease it apart? And how can we see how much power prosecutors actually have? And how can we show not only that power, but show how that power is being transformed right now as we speak? Um, through some of the uh, progressive elected. So it's, it's, it's complicated because it takes a long time. You know, we have to, I have to, I had to learn, I have to learn the language of how prosecutors work. And then I have to engage with them. They have to understand how artists work, which is another conversation because most of the time artists and prosecutors are not hanging out together. So we're creating a, a community together that'll eventually add other artists and you know there's a, there has to be a kind of intermingling of people this is really about people and breaking down boundaries so that common people which even though i'm an artist i'm also just a regular citizen you know of the united states interact with the rest of the society like i'm not just someone who needs to live in museums i need to also understand how the laws work how the prison system works and how much I want to abolish that system. And that takes some time, that takes investment. And thankfully we have people like Aggie and Catherine and lots of other people who are pushing to have, you know, citizens become more engaged, even if those citizens are well-known artists or emerging artists or people who are just coming out of being in cages. Um, and I think that that's, that's where we are. But I just want to say one last thing, which is, you know, to understand the history of where you are, which is, we are in the United States, but in this particular form, we're in Oregon. And to understand that in Oregon, in the 1920s, Oregon banned Black people. So that, for me, that is something I hold on to very much in my day to day. And it's something that I talked to Aggie about. I don't know if it's in the film, but it's something that was on my wall inside of that room. That's the type of conversation I've been able to have with Aggie and obviously all these, the folks here, you know, and like to be able to get that real and direct with people, that is something that can only happen when people, both parties are actually engaged and empathetic and humane to each other. And that's the society that we're trying to build right now. Thank you so much. That, um, it's interesting to hear you talk about how you're forging your art with real activism. And it's, it's one of the things that comes, th there's just, there, there's something about the way that the film, it, is it's such an intimate portrait of a person um, who clearly doesn't like the camera, but loves people and loves abstract ideas and love, she's so curious about challenging for, for I think art that sometimes a lot of people would find challenging. And one of the things that I wanted to ask um, probably Catherine and Gil, but it may be something that others of you want to weigh in on. What struck me about the film was its really beautiful structure. And you managed to, you put, there's tons of archival footage, there's photographs, there's artworks, there's archival footage, um, home movies, personal photographs, um, all the interviews. Um, it's kind of a daunting amount of material to get to put together. And watching it again there were like a couple moments in the film that i just was really really moved by and they sort of serve as like acts and one is the the 
the scene that leads into the AIDS epidemic was such a powerful, um, particularly resonant um, section. And then the scene where um, is um, Tenzin, I believe, asked the question about her, her, her first airplane ride and does she believe in angels that then goes into the Maria Inahosa interview about, and she talks about camps and the lynching, which really seems to like launch the third act. And I just wanted to know if you could talk about one, either the, the, the AIDS section or the, the, the final section that sort of kicks into the, the whole issue around um, racialized incarceration. Well, I mean, as far as the, the structure of the film, um, I think that's something that, that we identified early on uh, in the sense that, you know, Kat, Kat knew that she wanted to approach the film um, thematically, you know, as opposed to linearly or chronologically. And so when I came aboard and I, I kind of dove into this mountain of footage, um, I, you know, I approached, I approached looking at all the footage, you know, with a, with a sense of, you know, we have to extract, you know, thematic moments, you know, from all of these rather than, you know, just start at the beginning of her life and, you know, culminate in art for justice. So, I mean, you know, when you approach a film like that or story like that, it, it makes it much more of a challenge because, you know, you don't exactly know what's going to work, you know, until you start cutting things together. Um, but, um, but because we identified that early on and it wasn't something that we necessarily had to, you know, come around to, you know, we kind of dove in with that, with that approach. It, it um, you know, it really informed the way that we put the film together. We still didn't know if it was going to work as we were putting, you know, as we were putting all these pieces together. And, you know, I have to say that we, we, you know, because Aggie has lived such a full life and she's touched so many people and she's done so much, um, there was, there was, you know, there was such a wealth of uh, material that we really had to, you know, our challenge towards the end was what not to include um, because it was, um, it was all great. Um, but, um, but yeah, as far as those, um, those scenes, those kind of, uh, you know, we didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily laid out, you know, on a, on a board. We did have a board. We did, you know, index card everything. We had scenes that, you know, we knew were going to be crucial um, that we wanted to include, but there's a lot of trial and error structurally and, you know, many rough cut screenings and, you know, a lot of deliberation um, and a lot of, you know, hair pulling to finally arrive at that, at that moment, you know, where we kind of, everything crystallized and we, you know, we knew we had something that was cohesive and, and, compelling and cap captivating and, you know, hopefully, you know, took the viewer on an emotional journey um, and also, you know, hopefully inspired them to take their own journey. Well, I think one of the things that's so effective about the film too is that it's clear that um, you capture Aggie's journey as, as a mother, as a, as a woman, as a mother, as a patron of the arts, um, but really as a social being, and it's not like she came onto the planet as an enlightened person, but because of her empathy and because of her curiosity, you really take us on this, her journey of discovery and her opening up and how, and I just, I so, I so admire what all of you have done to share, to share, uh, a story in the way that you share the story. It doesn't have that sort of egocentric portrait. It really is a journey that calls on each of us to figure out what we can do. And what, and I guess it, it's going to sound like a corny question, but okay, Aggie had this amazing painting that she, it was a beloved painting that she decided to give up. She decided to sell for a very specific purpose. And a lot of us don't have $165 million paintings hanging on our walls. I'm just wondering what each of you would say to right now, 
what in terms of Aggie's legacy would you impart to view, like what can each of us do? And maybe that's too big of a question. If there's a way to break it down, um, you, you're all activists and you're all engaged this on a daily, on a daily basis. And there's a lot of people right now who are stuck inside. And what, is there, is there something you would ask of the people who've seen this film? Like what would be another step that we could each take? I would say just to, to dive in, I would say definitely if you have resources to, you should, you should fill yourself up with understanding the human condition, but especially if you're in the United States, which is a particular short narrative. I repeat this so much. The United States has the easiest narrative to understand, I feel like out of all countries, because it's such a young country. And I think if you have the resources, the time, there's so many things available on YouTube, in a library, on your smartphone, on your iPhone, understand the narrative of this country. Once you understand, and it's really easy to do, there are so many films on Aggie's website. You can email Tanya, Gil, Catherine, Adnan, me, whoever. Un learn the history of this country. I feel like that's something anyone can do at any moment on their own. And, and I think by learning the history of this country, you start to understand where the holes are, especially now as we live through this time of COVID and all of the information that's popping up on our iPhones on a regular basis about how this is, a, this is, this is affecting the, the, the incarcerated. Then you have you know people on reservations, you have immigrants who live here, you have the black community who's descendants of slavery. All of these people, all of these groups need support and extra care. And we need to elect representatives to make sure that we shift our society. But you, you, you can't really fully understand all of this fully, fully, fully until you really understand the dynamics of how this country was built. So that would be my, that is my, always my beat. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I mean, I'm a big advocate of storytelling and, you know, that comes in many different forms. You know, Zyberia does it one way, you know, another artist might do it a different way, but, you know, that's not the, just the domain of artists. I feel like now more than ever that, you know, we have tools like this and we're able to communicate, you know, with our friends and our family and, you know, with the outside world. I feel like, you know, continuing to tell our stories, you know, especially if we are in, you know, if, if, you know, we're part of a marginalized population or, you know, if we're, we're in trouble, you know, we're, we're, whoever we might be, I feel like continuing to tell our stories and not being afraid to speak out is, is, is paramount. It's crucial. You know, I mean, that's like, you know, we might not ha all have, you know, a huge painting to sell, but we do have our stories and that's, you know, that's, that's priceless. Thank you. Um, Tanya, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add and what, um, what Zaveria said, uh, encapsulates like everything that we should be taking away from this film and i would to only add to that because i feel like she said everything um is that forever who sees the film to become an ambassador for the film and to spread the word about the film so that more people see it and more people become inspired by it the other thing i would say is you know the takeaways from the film are the importance of supporting the arts and artists mm. and also supporting social justice and to making to, to make sure that you recognize the interconnection between those two things. Um, the third thing is I feel because of the context in which this film is emerging, which is the context of the pandemic, we realize even more how we, how urgent it is that we look out for each other. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that we took for granted, I think, that has become so, so um, like, deep like shaking us to our souls like how we are all so connected to each other and how even if the political powers that be which as a very highlights we need to change if they don't advocate for equality and humanity even when political powers that be seek to keep us apart and see our differences that we need to see our shared humanity and i feel like that is a real message of the film i wanted to thank you i wanted to ask you before just a follow up um for people who for people to become an ambassador of this film, 
given what's going on right now, um, how can other people see this film? So people should sign up for the mailing list at the website. And the production company behind it also, Auburn Pictures, has its own mailing list. And to um, follow our social channels, we are bringing on a distributor. Of course, distribution now is an ever morphing um, organism. So we'll see what form that takes. But that is the best way and just to talk about it and to stay engaged through the website. Okay, thank you. It will get out. It will either be on television, it will be streaming. If we cannot gather in theaters within the next six to 12 months, we will just go straight to the streaming and, the, and, and to television. And I know I want to hear what we should do now, Adnan, too. I want to just it sort of tie together what I saw as the last few comments, because I think what links us right now is our uncertainty and that that's basically all we really totally have in common and and that that's what we tried to do in this film to go to your point laura about structure is to say you know here's this thing art for justice that is is very unique and brings together some unusual components and how you know when we were talking about how to structure the film we basically had to say how did she get here? We didn't want to do a biopic. We weren't interested in that. But we were interested in telling the story of Art for Justice. And the only way to do that was to keep dialing back. Well, why is it this? And why? how did she get to a point where she had this and understood this this way? And so we kept adding little things down to her class, at her like art class at the Cleveland Museum, which seemed like a really important thing. Like that was her first encounter with art. Because what we found was throughout the thing that connected her was art. When people talk about her empathy, which we often do, I think she got that from artwork, from being, oh, you know, who knows, chicken or egg? We, Gil and I had to just settle on art being sort of the foundational element. And, and so to me, to answer your question, what do we do now? I think back to AIDS, that's my reference. For a lot of people, it's Hurricane Katrina. For some people, it's the fires in paradise that just happened. But, you know, going back to AIDS and what Gil said, you know, to me, what's important right now that we do is make sure that the stories, the material is gathered, that what is happening inside to people inside, whether they can film it or not, or whether we can keep gathering it and, and sharing it in whatever ways, and people are finding incredible ways to share stories, that the archive, you know, just like with AIDS, we always said, there will be a time when AIDS is over and people are going to look for material to say what happened during that time. And we were this tiny little collective that made videos. And right now that is the newsreel of the AIDS crisis. Any movie, you know, the big, the one that got the most attention, um, uh, David Francis film, how to survive a plague. That's like a third of that half of that film is footage that was shot by me and other members of Diva TV during the AIDS crisis. We need to be sure that we're gathering, that we're still prioritizing our storytelling, whether we're filmmakers or artists or writers, theater, whatever your medium for getting it and collecting information, the historical information that Siberia mentions, to being able to share it and know that we will have it because if it's in a month when they start telling the story about what's happening in Cook County, we need to be sure that there are people who are connected to Cook County from the inside, who are either inside, their parents are inside, their family members are inside, their lovers are inside, they just got out, you know, which is a whole nother, they work there as CEOs, they're, you know, wh whatever their connection is, we need, we need to be the ones telling these stories. We cannot leave it as we know to our federal government and our mainstream media. And, and it's hard because I was actually on a Zoom right before this with the Marshall Project, and they were talking about how they can't, you know, they're not even telling, like you can't get information about your loved one. And Adnan, I know you'll get to put in the last word here, but you know, there are people, they contacted one person and said they were gonna put their person on a ventilator and didn't have any contact with them again for four days, for four days, not to say whether, and then, you know, and some people, they just call them up and say they've died. They won't let them see them. They'll send a picture, but not a, a final picture. Like there's no, it, the, the inhumanity about what's happening. I mean, I do think that what's happening right now is, is stripping us all down, you know, that, it, and, and, and maybe that is what people are talking about when they say our commonality, that there's suddenly this element of like, who are you with? What do you need to eat? How are you going to, you know, 
find money to pay for the food that you need now? How are you going to do the most simple things? I mean, I went to the supermarket this morning and I was like counting back hours from this, from this Zoom call and saying like, am I going to have enough time? Because it's so stressful to go and it, it, it involves not only like mental preparation, but even being there and waiting in these lines with the six feet between and there's only 20 people allowed in at a time. I mean, and then when you're in there and everyone's trying to stay away and everybody looks like, I mean, it's like, so there is something very basic about this moment that I think that we can, that we, we need to make sure people have a hold up. And I think that Viria, that goes to back to what she was saying is that, you know, we need to make sure everyone has that foundation, that everyone has a place to sleep, that everyone has food to eat. And, that and, and understanding that abolition doesn't mean let everyone out and it's all good. It's exactly just to let Adnan take it away. A abolition means securing a future for people, a, a really healthy, real, fertile future. And I'll give it to you, Adnan. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you. I appreciate I mean, this is such a, a very, very stimulating conversation. I've learned a lot just within the last hour, uh, 54 minutes. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. Quickly, if I could uh, jump on your point, uh, Kat, that it, it's crazy. I was talking yesterday on the phone with, with my friend, and we're talking about how we're literally trying to save the world or make systemic changes through our fingertips at the mercy, for the most part, uh, uh, for the, at the mercy of our homes and our phones and our laptops. I mean, I didn't know how, how powerful fingertips and thumbs can be. And they are. I mean, we're in this age of like what you're talking about, like to document these things and email and social media is such a huge can be or is a lifesaver now. Uh, I mean, we saw uprisings earlier in this decade in the 2010s, 11s in, in Middle East and uh, North Africa happening with that, with, with, uh, Algeria and, and you know, with Libya, um, Egypt. And similarly, I feel like that is also happening now. Um, so the power of documentation, the power of social media, the power of organizing through um, our fingertips um, is so unique. And when historians study this time and artists in the future study this time, it's going to be such a, such a profound, profound time because this, this is changing the trajectory of how human beings evolve or not evolve, right? Um, if there's a possibility we might be rewinded a little bit, but I, one thing I want to maybe if I go off and I don't want to go off in that tangent, um, speaking of rewind, if I could rewind, rewind back like a couple of questions. And I just want to say that the, the thing that stuck out to me a lot, and I keep thinking about the movie, uh, Aggie, um, Kat, I think we talked about this is the, the beauty of the, the different types of intersectionalities that were taking place. And, and so arguably, yes, you could say art and activism are two separate things. Uh, for many, they could be the same thing, but there is definitely uh, in this movie an, an intersectionality of art and activism. There's intersectionality of, the, of histories coming together with di different demographics of histories coming together, right? You talked about the AIDS movement, mass incarceration. Um, there's so many different uh, threads that are beautifully, beautifully tied together. But the most important thing that sticks out is the story is told through Aggie and 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 to, in the spirit of art and use a metaphor, I mean she's she's not merely an observer. She she's in the art. She's in the piece, and quite literally, she's in the the movement with you, Cat. Like uh, you know, when when the 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 daughter, the mothers who support daughters of LGBTQ, and um, she's in the MoMA. I mean, not only you know that that picture of of all these white men on the board of MoMA sitting behind her, and she's just sitting there like, you know, and everything that she represents. I mean, that picture in itself is historic and artistic. Right. Um, then you talk about mass incarceration and where else is she? She's in San Quentin in the prison facility with me, a person who's serving a life sentence since he was a teenager. I mean, constantly like here she is inside all these pieces of art, but specifically in pieces of movements, like in the middle. So going back to the question, what can we do? I think that I think that absolutely is true. It's already been said. Educate yourself. Um, you have information readily available on these websites, on Google, on on social media. Then after educating yourself, or if you already know about this stuff, then you have to, it's a very individual question. How are you going to place yourself based on your resources, based on what you have? What, is it time? Is it finance? Is it a uh, um, privilege to go to a governor or go to someone in power or go to a district attorney, uh, a sheriff, and to reduce the population on top of that? Are you, I mean, we're getting creative in California. We're looking at, uh, we're calling out churches, calling to churches, mosques and synagogues to use some of your place, uh, 
your homes or, or sorry, those structures for uh, homes or houses for people who are, who are coming out um, to utilize uh, sheltering, clothing and feeding people um, in this time. And so there's different creative ways. I mean, in, again, in the spirit of art, there's opportunities for us to be creative in how we help. And so once you educate yourself, ask yourself what resources available to you and then start getting artistic and start getting creative and coming up with solutions on your own and then mobilizing and organizing with the rest of the community of activists and advocates. Thank you so, so much that you, you're all so wonderfully articulate. I want to invite uh, the viewers um, to submit their questions um, on Facebook um, the day of the screen. And if you have any questions and put, if you go to the festival's Facebook page, you in the comment section, you can post your questions and Catherine will be answering them. So I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I asked like five of 20 questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can easily do a, a Q&A with each and every one of you for several hours, but I just want to thank you for sharing the film. Thank you for making it available to the Ashland Independent Film Festival audience. And um, stay safe, sit, stay strong, and stay heartful. Thank you.